Greetings and welcome everyone. We are honored to introduce to you today a special guest speaker, a genuine humanitarian diplomat, and a highly esteemed acquaintance of ours who has worked around the world um, in the Middle East, Europe, Africa, and Asia. Siddharth Chatterjee is the United Nations resident coordinator in China, where he works on the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals. Prior to this position, he served as the UNFPA representative and the UN resident coordinator in Kenya. Mr. Chatterjee has more than 25 years of experience in international cooperation, sustainable development, humanitarian coordination, and peace and security. He successfully negotiated the release of thousands of child soldiers in South Sudan, and he was recognized by the Global Polio Eradication Initiative as an influencer on the eradication of polio. Mr. Chatterjee has served in some of the most volatile and fragile parts of the world and is a prolific writer on humanitarian and development issues. He is a champion of generational equality and sexual reproductive health and rights. He is a public policy graduate from the Princeton School of, Pu of Public and International Affairs of Princeton University. And now for a few welcoming remarks from the Dean of the Party Rand Graduate School, Dr. Susan Marquis. Thank you very much, Joan. If I can say thank you to Joan Chang and to just completely blanked to Krishma Patel. It's like not like I don't know you, Krishma, <laughs> but thank you very much for introducing us to um, Mr. Chatterjee. And if I may welcome you, sir, it's a pleasure to have you with us, even if we're in our virtual rooms. And it's actually one of the advantages of a pandemic because we get to connect around the world a lot more easily. This event is being hosted by the school, the Party Ran Graduate School, but also the Center for Asia and Pacific Policy. So I want to thank Rafik Dosani for helping being part of this and Krishna Kumar as well. Um, just welcome to everyone. We have a great turnout today. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking so we can hear from our expert here, but I will note that a couple of things. Q&A, well, we will have Q&A after uh, the presentation, and you may put your comments as usual Zoom in the Q&A section on Zoom, and we'll uh, be referring to those. Uh, Krishna is going to be running the Q&A afterwards. So thank you, sir. I look forward to your talk. Nice to meet you. Well, Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for that kind introduction, Susan. I'm delighted to meet you and the rest of your team. Thank you, Joanne. Thank you, Krishna. So let's start at the very beginning and, and, and look at Africa's youth population, which is rapidly growing and is expected to reach about 850 million the young people by 2050. Now, whether this spells a promise or peril depends upon how the continent manages its youth population. Consider this, every 24 hours, nearly 35,000 youth across Africa join the search for, uh, for employment. About 60% will be joining the army of the unemployed. Africa's population is expected to reach about 2.5 billion by 2050. The accompanied increase in its working age populations creates a massive window of opportunity which if properly harnessed can translate into a higher growth and yield a demographic dividend. Now, since the beginning of 2020, about 575 people have died in the Mediterranean, but the real number is estimated to be much higher according to IOM, the International Organization for Migration. A majority of them are African. A report from the United Nations High Commission for Refugees claims that seven in 10 heading to Europe are not refugees fleeing war or persecution, but economic migrants in search of a better life. Now, on one hand, Africa has the fastest expanding youth population in the world with the potential to fuel unprecedented rates of economic growth and realize the vision 2063, the African Union agenda. On the other hand, the aspiration of Africa's youth are frustrated by chronic unemployment and lack of opportunities. Some experts fear that this may even lead to social unrest and political uprising. Why? The continent has in great part done very well on multiple counts. It will take a great part to depend on devising the right policies and building the right partnerships, thus realizing the promise of the SDGs and the Vision 2063. There is an opportunity, ladies and gentlemen, and that is a growing youth population. Take, for example, Sub-Saharan Africa, which is growing at about 2.7% a year, which is more than twice as fast as South Asia, which is at about 1.2%, or Latin America, which is at 0.9%.
that means that Africa is adding a population of France or Thailand every two years. Now, although Asia's population is four times bigger, almost two children are born every year in Africa for every three in Asia. At the current rates, Africa's population will obviously double. Nigeria, for example, is forecast to have 400 million people by 2050, meaning it will overtake the United States as the third most populous country. The large pool of labor available in the country enable the fast expansion, for example, of the Dan Gote Group, which is progressing steadily towards its target of a million jobs. In Kenya, a country that I've known well, the population is expected to surpass 100 million people from its current 46 million by 2050. Now, if accompanied by the right policies, including education and labor market policies, these numbers indicate the clear potential to fuel growth share prosperity, achieve the SDGs, and accomplish Vision 2063. A youth bulge in a peaceful, relatively stable country with a rapidly growing econo economy will amplify economic growth and development, resulting in the so-called demographic dividend. Most African countries have the potential to reap the demographic dividend and achieve growth. The peril. The peril, ladies and gentlemen, is the lack of opportunities and inequality. According to the World Bank, 40% of the people who join rebel movements are motivated by a lack of economic opportunity. The UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, noted that the frustration in young people that have no hope in the future is a major source of insecurity in today's world. And it is essential that when governments plan their economic activities, when the international community develops forms of cooperation, they put youth employment, youth skills at the center of their priorities. Some estimates indicate that around a million African mig migrants who went to the uh, uh, European Union just between 2013 and 2020, in the last seven years, adding to the already millions flowing from Syria and Iraq and Yemen and Afghanistan and parts of Asia. Many of Africa's young people remain trapped in poverty and that is reflected in multi-dimensions blighted by poor education, access to poor quality health, malnutrition, and lack of job opportunities. For many young people, especially girls, the lack of access to sexual reproductive health services is depriving them of their rights and the ability to make decisions about their bodies and plan their families. This is adversely affecting their education and employment opportunities as well. The ILO reports, the International Labor, uh, Labor Organization, that one in five youth are not in employment, education or training, which is also called NEET. In, and this is the figures of 2019. Now, this state of joblessness has been steadily growing since 2012, mirroring trends in the global rate. The NEET rate is projected to increase slightly by 0.3 percentage points uh, uh, to 20.8 in 2021. Young women are particularly affected by the NEET status with a gender gap of around 10 percentage points since 2018. However, Africa's gender gap compares favorably and particularly compared to Asia, the Pacific, Arab states region, where in the region it is at about 20 to 30 percentage points respectively. In a, in a large cohort of young people who cannot find employment and earn satisfactory income, the youth bulge therefore becomes a demographic bump because of large mass of frustrated youth is likely to become a potential source of social and political instability. The youth militias of Sierra Leone is a point in case. The political violence that we've seen in parts of South Sudan, the exploitation by political and military elites of young people in countries like Liberia and Northeastern Nigeria are stark reminders of the negative impact of exceedingly young populations that can have in Africa. As such, one basic measure of a country's success in turning the youth bulge into a demographic dividend is to address the issue of youth unemployment. Now, as a result of migration, it, it, it will continue to deplete the human capital in the continent, thus having a, a, a multiplier effect and unintended consequences on the future of the continent itself. A youth bulge can also impact government finances. Many African countries still remain a larger, uh, largely subsistence sector, which can't be taxed. So most young people are self-employed 
either in business or agriculture, and this makes it quite difficult to impute or no one's income in order to determine the taxable income. Now, between 10 to 12 million uh, Africans are joining the labor force every year, yet the continent is creating barely about three, three to five million, three to 3.5 million jobs. Now, without sustained and urgent action, the specter of migration looms. And ladies and gentlemen, no Navy, no Army, no wall, no Coast Guard will be able to stop this large migration, which stands at the cusp of a demographic crisis. A recent study by the ILO of 2018 shows that an overwhelming majority of African youth aged between 15 to 24, which is about 94.9%, are informally employed, little or no education, are rural-based, and mainly engaged in subsistence agriculture. Further, a rapid urbanization associated with a potential workforce migrating in search of jobs can change the landscape of human settlement, posing significant risks on the living and health conditions, education levels, the environment, and on development. So what are the policy options in terms of this? Taking advantage of the opportunity arising from the youth wealth depends on a conducive policy environment and on effective instruments in human capital to ensure a healthy and educated workforce and facilitate inclusive growth. The conventional approach of dealing with the youth bulge is to make young people job ready. The idea is that people's skills need to be increased to enhance their productivity in the labor market. I recall the words of Roosevelt when he said that, you know, we may not be able to build a future for the youth, but let's go ahead and build the youth for the future. And this is precisely what we need. But we also need a new concept of productivity one that expands from its classical economic sense and includes environmental and social dimensions in line with the sustainable development goals. The SDGs are associated with youth employment, relate both to technical and vocational skills for employment, decent jobs and entrepreneurship, and to productive employment and decent work. The achievement of SDG 4, which is on quality education, and SDG 8, which is on decent work and economic growth, is key for the development of the largest generation of youth that the world has ever seen. Opportunities can be grouped in partnerships, in innovation, and, and in learning for the world. So what would these partnerships look like? We need to look at beyond the traditional stakeholders that bring to bear the resources, experience, expertise, and contribution. We must look at these counterparts that have most to offer in view of the history and their ambitions. For the future. My hope, ladies and gentlemen, is the establishment of think tanks to pool together the intellectual capital and leadership from the United States, from China, from Africa to help achieve the SDGs in the African countries coordinated by the United Nations, in line with the concept of South-South cooperation, North-South cooperation, and triangular cooperation. It will create mechanisms for an international dialogue and cooperation on policy challenges facing Africa, including youth unemployment. I'm not thinking about a virtual platform. I'm thinking about a significant investment in real assets to develop a center of, ex uh, of excellence, perhaps based in Kenya, to rival the likes of the Brookings institutions or the Council of Foreign Relations or the Earth Institute and more. The center will have a strong focus on applied research. Africa is not just interested in research for the sake of research but in its applicability to concrete problems faced by the continent with a view to offer real concrete solutions. The model of such a center is currently being considered and it should have a small number of long-term resident faculty members and a large number of perhaps 80 to 90% of faculty members that are rotating fellows. It will have solid financial patrons attract prestigious names from academia across fields in the natural and social science. It will be anchored in science and the value of independent scientific research. Now, because of its own remarkable history and tradition of research excellence, the RAND Corporation is obviously an important partner that I see joining this venture. I invite you to consider joining the United Nations in co-creating this particular center with us. Now, with Africa's digital revolution, there are more than 400 tech hubs that have sprung up across the continent in Lagos, 
in Nigeria, in, in La La Nairobi, in Cape Town, emerging as internationally recognized technology centers. These cities now host thousands of startups along the incubators, accelerators, innovation hubs, make, makers of space, you know, technology parks, co-working spaces, and that support them. Notable successes include the lending app Branch International. Efforts like these will become increasingly important to help hyper-connected and entrepreneurial youth uh, populations on its way to a digital future. Just imagine that if we could connect Silicon Valley and Shenzhen and bring them into Africa. Imagine what this convergence of big data technology and innovation can do to really change the paradigm. And the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, Amina Mohammed, often says that, you know, we have to flip the orthodoxy. The conventional model of development has not worked. And that is why Africa is being left behind. We have to rethink, rewire, re reimagine the entire focus of how we now seek to develop that continent. Let's learn from the world. East Asian economies have been able to turn to the, turn the youth bulge into, an, into a demographic dividend. Take the Republic of Korea as an example. Over the last 40 years, the dependency ratio declines uh, substantially in Korea. In addition to a dramatic GDP growth and rapid increase in average wages, youth unemployment has been below 12% and often in the single digits in recent years. The same is true for China. Its dependency ratios followed a similar pattern of Korea. Since initiating economic reforms in the late 70s, China has been able to generate millions of jobs it has, and relocating young workers from low productivity agricultural activities to high productivity manufacturing, all without experiencing high employment amongst a youthful labor force. Imagine, in the last four decades, China has been able to lift 800 million people out of poverty. And in the last seven years, close to about 90 million people out of abject poverty. African economies may opt to transition young workers from low productivity activities like subsistence farming to light manufacturing and higher end, more specialized manufacturing. And that includes the agribusiness space and also facilitate access to funds to enhance value chains across the, all in the entire sector of agriculture. Ladies and gentlemen, let me give you a few figures if that is helpful. In the health sector, the healthcare business is likely to grow to about $400 billion by the next nine years in Africa. This is in, in, in by 2030. Agriculture is likely to grow beyond $1 trillion by 2030. If we were to look at the affordable housing space and imagine if we could bear to bring 3D printer technology into Africa where the indignity of not having a home where refugees still have to go live or displaced people still have to go on, 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 on um, plastic sheeting and tarpaulins that are given out by UNHCR and UN agencies, it's heartbreaking. Something needs to change. The manufacturing sector, we don't need to put Africa through the second and third industrial revolution. Let's leapfrog them into the fourth industrial revolution. Keep in mind, we have an aging demographic in most of the Western countries, which includes the United States, Western Europe, most of the Asian tiger economies, meaning there's going to be an increased demand for labor in the region and younger population. It also means larger markets for economies seeking to benefit from the growth of a rapidly expanding African middle class. Consumer spending in Africa is projected to reach about $1.4 trillion just in the next three years, and business to business spending to about $3.5 trillion in, by, by 2030. In the wake of the Second World War, the Marshall Plan helped to rebuild shattered European economies in the interest of growth and stability. We need a plan of similar ambition that places youth employment in Africa at the center of development. Here is where I see a massive opportunity of academia, of think tanks, of the private sector, of CEOs like the likes of Jeff Bezos and Eric Schmidt and the Jack Ma's and the Pony Ma's and Dan Gotes and the James Mwangi coming together and rethinking a new business model, a new enterprise of public-private partnerships that can have a transformative effect in leapfrogging African economies. 
because the leapfrogging of African economies will keep the rest of the world prosperous. Now, whether the future of Africa is promising or perilous will depend on how the continent too and the international community moves from the stated intent to urgent action and must give special priority to those SDGs that give the competent a competitive edge for its company. The core of the SDGs is about ending poverty, is ensuring healthy lives, and ensuring inclusive, equitable, and quality education. And all have a particular resonance with the challenge of empowering youth and making them effective economic citizens. The likes of Henrietta Four of the United Nations Children Fund, together with the Secretary General of the UN, together with the presidents of Kenya and, and Rwanda, all have come together to launch what is called Generation Unlimited. It is about tapping the unlimited potential of young people, particularly so in Africa, where we want to make sure that by 2030, every young person is either in school or in education or gainfully employed. There is hope. Many, many young people in Africa are taking charge of their futures. There is a rising, rising tide of entrepreneurship sweeping across Africa, spanning technology, IT, innovation, small and medium enterprises. They are creating jobs for themselves and for their community. We need to redouble our efforts to address the risks and seize the opportunity. All, need, all have a part to play governments, the private sector, academia, civil society, the international community. Ladies and gentlemen, what I witness in China every day reminds me that Africa has a future. It is a country where the per capita GDP in 1979 was a mere $180. The per capita GDP of South Korea in 1979 was $1,800. The per capita GDP of the United States of America was $15,000. The United States of America's per capita GDP today is at around $60,000. That of China is at around $12,000. In the next seven to eight years, I see China's per capita GDP going beyond $25,000. So what does this mean? We are looking at two economic giants who can change the world. The convergence points are around employment, are around the, the environment, are around making sure that the global public health becomes a global good, are around the digital landscape, are around making sure that mutually reinforcing each other would actually lead to an exponential move forward given the fact that the COVID-19 has reminded us that we have being struck by an economic crisis, a humanitarian crisis, and a development crisis that rivals the Great Depression of the 1930s. It brings back to memory the words of Herophilus when he said that, you know, without health, we have no wit, we have no strength, we have no wealth, we have no prosperity. The primacy of sustainable development goal number three has suddenly come back front and center. It even showed that the most advanced economies in the world in the face of a pandemic, turned upside down. I was recently at the Boal Forum for Asia, the equivalent of the Davos for Asia hosted in the Hainan province. Once an absolute backwater, impoverished, small village city is to be a rising city which hosts, you know, the who's who from the corporate world in Asia. And they recently launched a report. It's called the, the Deficits that to achieve the sustainable development goals. And they identify four deficits that are holding us back from achieving the sustainable development goals by 2030. A health deficit, a green deficit, an infrastructure deficit, and a digital deficit. And we need to address these four deficits collectively. No one country, no one enterprise can do it on its own. And therefore, when I talk about when Silicon Valley and Shenzhen come together, the creativity in the space of artificial intelligence, in the space of quantum computing, in the space of biotech, in the space of, of fintech can have, can have exponential impact on the way we see the growth trajectory. And this is not about 
This is, we need, as I said, we need to rethink development model. This is not about traditional aid going into Africa. We need to rearrange the development model that has afflicted Africa all this time. That is why it has kept it rather stagnant. We need more foreign direct investment. We need more partners collaborating and achieving scale. And this is what the US and China can bring to bear. So regardless of the geopolitics, I see these potential convergence points around the uh, economy, around uh, the environment. As uh, recently, John Kerry was here having discussions with his Chinese counterpart as to what the US and China could do, do together in dealing with the climate emergency that we confront. And Kerry commented that the green revolution will rival the industrial revolution. That opportunity of partnerships really lies. Just imagine that if we could come together with a multilateral platform, renew the promise of multilateralism, the very signature that was dotted in 1945 in San Francisco. This is the aspiration Harry Truman had. Ladies and gentlemen, the United Nations stands ready to do its part. I frankly and hope that the RAND Corporation will also join us in this journey. Thank you. All right, Krishma, you're on. Perfect. Thank you. If I may just say one more time, thank you very much, Sid. It's terrific to meet you. And uh, I always like having you know, that this that Princeton connection is a good one. So I'm going to turn it over to Karishma. I just wanted to jump in because I couldn't tell who was saying anything. <laughs> so you're in charge, Karishma. Thanks so much, Dean Marquis. Um, and thank you so much, Mr. Chatterjee, for your presentation. Um, super informative and um, really nice to hear. I think we'll have some questions coming in a little bit. But in the meanwhile, I might take the privilege of being the moderator to ask a question. You mentioned towards the end quite a few things about um, the potential for US and China cooperation in Africa. I was wondering uh, if you could speak a little bit more like from the UN perspective, a lot of agreements have turned to be bilateral. And I was wondering um, if you saw the potential of the US and Chinese cooperation, well, maybe not so cooperation, but their involvement in Africa continuing to be bilateral and by by that um, shaping a kind of competition or cooperation in Africa or how it would move towards a multilateral cooperation? That's a good question. So let me put it this way. You know, when the United Nations Secretary General came on board uh, in 2017, he came with a very clear agenda of reforming the UN, of making the UN fit for purpose. Today, the expectation of all member states, including the, Uni the United States, is that a UN, number one, which is fit for purpose, number two, that delivers as one, number three, that leaves no one behind. Now, this is where every United Nations country team is working in lockstep with its member states. So whether in Kenya or in Nigeria or in Ethiopia or in Uganda, they're all working in lockstep with it. The advantage of having the UN there is you have the best in class social policy experts, economists, you know, uh, project managers, people who understand health systems and water systems and, and the digital infrastructure, people who can work with the government, provide them with the best in class guidance. So both at the upstream level of providing, providing guidance and framing of policies, as we've seen during the COVID response and the post-COVID economic recovery. African countries by and large found their UN country teams in lockstep with their ambition of not only dealing with the pandemic, but also recovering from it. And here is where, regardless of whether the nature is bilateral or not, this is where the UN could actually have a supportive role. And what we hope to do, and this is what we did in Kenya, we created a public-private partnership platform way back in 2014. The original partners to that platform were Huawei from China, Merck from the United States of America, um, GlaxoSmithKline from the UK, uh, Safaricom from Kenya, um, Philips from, from the Netherlands came together. I was then the head of UNFPA. Together with UNICEF and WHO, we went into six of the remotest counties of Kenya, which had the highest maternal mortality ratios in, the, in, in Kenya at that time. And we were able, able to reduce it by one third 
because we were able to converge big data technology and innovation and converge around these ideas. So we got invited to the World Economic Forum in 2017. What the UN was able to do was to act as a connector, a convener, and a catalyzer. And this is where I see the real, proper, real value proposition of the new UN that the Secretary General is trying to create. Thanks. Um, just to let everyone know, uh, we've had a little issue with the Q&A box, and it's open now. So you can ask your questions. But in the meanwhile, Jennifer is wanting to ask a question. I'm going to pass it over to Rafiq to ask in person. Thank you, Karishma. Siddharth, uh, the question I have is about China's Belt and Road Initiative. It's already ongoing for some years. It's apparently having fairly large transformative effects in various parts of Africa. You know, one reads about the standard gauge railway in Kenya, all the issues, all the work that's being done to extend it, other projects. Um, so in that context, what else is needed? I mean, China is already there. Uh, why do we need new partnerships if the investment is already going in? Thank you. Not enough. If we are looking at an Africa free trade area where the Africa wants to become the next European Union, we need much more Belt and Road Initiative. We need much more, as I mentioned, the infrastructure deficit, which is, which is rampant. And if you look at the Marshall Plan of, of post-Second World War Europe, a lot of it was focused on infrastructure creation and therefore jobs got created. I mean, I can imagine when Chinese companies and a company like Bechtel were, come to, were to come together, imagine what they can do in terms of transforming the infrastructure landscape. I have seen firsthand the road that goes all the way from the port of Lamu all the way to Addis through the border towns of, of Kenya and Ethiopia, which have had rampant um, internecine violence. Ever since that road came in, the UN on both sides, the UN country team in Ethiopia, the UN country team in Kenya came together in these places which had, which had internecine conflicts. And we were not only able to end those conflicts, but those roads became the arteries of commerce and free movement of goods and service. That is precisely the ambition that the African Union has through the Africa free trade area. So there is enormous needs for much more Belt and Road. And this is where I see the Blue Dot Network and BRI coming together and making sure that we are on international norms and standards. But Rafiq, you know, I realize that it is also mired in, in many controversies, but you know, a road is a road. No one's gonna stop you because of your nationality or the type of car you drive. It's a global public good, which is built there. What I'm hoping is there are more private sector partners supported by the UN that could actually give more velocity to infrastructure development, because that is what will ensure that we can have the free movement of good services and people which is what which will what will underpin a united, prosperous, economically viable Africa, which mirrors or perhaps even is better than the European Union. Thanks for a really inspiring uh, talk, uh, Siddharth. So in 2011, of course, we had the Arab Spring in the Middle East, uh, and the primary reason for that was lack of economic opportunities for youth. And the median age, as you mentioned, of African countries is even lower. Um, and uh, is there, you know, you mentioned the possibility of migration, right? Like the African uh, youth and others who do not have economic opportunity will migrate primarily to Europe. Do you see Arab Spring 2.0 really being an African Spring 2.0? Is that a worry that we have to think about as well? You know, President Uhuru Kenyatta, the president of Kenya, once remarked, actually, I think it was back in 2015, 2015, 2016, he said that youth unemployment is an existentialist threat for many African countries. I mean, over 70% of the population in most African countries is less than 30. In Kenya alone, the age group of 15 to 26, about a million of them join the workforce every year. And there are barely about 150,000 jobs being created. That's just a microcosm of the, of the of, that's why I talked about 35,000 Africans looking for work every 24 hours. So we have a major challenge. And mind you, when you will start to see large scale migration, it will actually lead to much more instability in Europe. As I said, the combined might of all the armed forces of, of Europe will not be able to stop these new waves of millions of boats coming in. It is actually, if you, if you look at the old migration that happened out of Europe, when Italy and Ireland were some of the largest migrants that headed towards, uh, towards the United States of America, it's because, first of all, the people were extremely impoverished, and second of all, governments didn't work. 
So we have to work at multiple levels on issues of governance, on issues of rule of law, on issues of, of uh, proper utilization of, of lending and financing. This is where the UN can provide what I would call not just a moral compass, but actually our presence helps to do this. The fact is in the six years that I was there in Kenya, we created this public-private partnership platform. We have identified up to $30 billion worth of investments for Kenya to go into the manufacturing sector. And the private sector feels much more comfortable having the presence of the UN there. Yes, there are political changes that happen and people see things from different lenses, but I think the consistency that the UN can provide, particularly in the acceleration that we need for the 2030 agenda, we need much more activity here. We need, you know, we need to, as I said, rethink and, you know, perhaps there is a space for geopolitics, but I think there is much more space for collaboration around the areas of public health and, and manufacturing and digitization and infrastructure. And of course, the biggest global threat is the environment. Uh, hi, Sid. Uh, wonderful to hear your talk. Just to give us a really good overview. I, you just mentioned the public health. So my, my background is global health, public health. So I have two questions. Uh, one is uh, that given the demographic changes and given that Africa continent overall has very limited capacity of building their medicine supplies. Somewhere I read 95% of the medicine on the continent were imported. So it really depending on the donors and, and uh, external support for their medicine. So I see when we look at this uh, population growth, we're also expecting a huge need uh, for medicine and for the future. Then my question is, what would be the first step, you know, in terms of the infrastructure? Is uh, local production in Africa possible? Are there discussion on this? And whether they are, you know, regional blocks that's uh, willing to work with either U.S. and China or China, uh, given China's building these infrastructures. So that's my first question: is about, you know, where to start. And the second question is, what are uh, Africans see about U.S.-China conflicts, geopolitics, given the the presence of both, say, power uh, in that continent? Uh, I wonder if you could uh, enlighten us on that. Thank you. I think, uh, as I mentioned, Jennifer, that the healthcare business in Africa is likely to go to about $400 billion over the next nine years. And perhaps this was pre-COVID. And, you know, we were doing, uh, we were working with McKinsey, who was part of the platform that we were on and, uh, and, and what it would take for African growth trajectory in the healthcare space. What COVID did was it kind of fell like rain over a roof and suddenly we realized how many holes that roof had and, and that, you know, as I said, it, it kind of impacted global economies too. Next year, we are going to be seeing vaccines being produced out of, out of Senegal. You know, mm -hmm. there is already a, a, a pretty strong generic drug industry in South Africa, in Kenya. There is no absence of talent. Now it is a matter of bringing companies into that space. This is why Merck, for example, the Merck US was a partner with us. That public-private partnership that we started on, on maternal health in, in, in 2014 has now turned into a $250 million public-private partnership. In Kenya, they did not see US and, and, and uh, Chinese geopolitics pay out because they saw Merck and Huawei working together. So, you know, I really believe that the private sector can actually be the engines of that growth. They need to have a stake in that space of multilateralism. But it is clear that SDG3 or universal health coverage is going to be the anchor around which global, uh, you know, all the SDGs will be achieved. And the intersection of health and environment has become absolutely clear. In fact, the conversation I'm having now uh, with Tsinghua universities Perhaps we could even think of a mid-career program for professionals out of the US, out of China, out of African countries, where we look at the intersection of, of, uh, econo of environment and, and health, and they become the key advisors in the policy space, because quite clearly what this pandemic has done is shown how fragile we are as a human race. I mean, we are confronted by an existentialist crisis, not just by the climate, but that has got further ex exacerbated by this transmission of zoonotic diseases, and this is not the last pandemic to come. So how do we future-proof ourselves from the health systems? 
And that will come when we start to create a robust health system in all of Africa. So I think that's point number one, and that's going to be absolutely clear. And I see huge opportunities for American, Chinese, European countries collaborating in the space of public health in, in Africa. And, and the returns of investment on that would be massive as we see the population grow, because I only talked about the 2050 demographic uh, you know, trends, which is going to be about 2.5 billion in Africa, the largest market of consumers and producers. But we'll be looking at approximately you know, three and a half to four billion Africans by the end of the century. So keep the, those are real demographic trends. And from a from pure economics point of view, you know, it is based on supply and demand. And economies are never functioning independently. They intersect. And this is where I see the convergence of regardless of what is happening uh, in terms of the, the geopolitical space, I see, again, opportunities of convergence, particularly around the development agenda and of leaving no one behind. So that the principles are there. The charter of the UN is about being a bridge. And I hope this is what the expectation of the UN Secretary General is of every one of his resident coordinators, that we, are, be, we become a bridge between you know, different views and differing opinions. It's natural, but we have a shared humanity, Jennifer, and that is what we need to focus on. Okay, so we have a few questions in the chat. Um, the first one is from Atul Manocha. How does the current UN Security Council structure with veto power with a handful of countries, including China, create challenges for what you've envisioned here in this talk? It is a challenge, no doubt, Atul. And, and that is why we are looking at the entire UN systems reform that the Secretary General has initiated. So hopefully, you know, as he's, as he's moving into his second term, these are issues that key member states of the, of the Permanent Five, as well as the Security Council, really need to look at is how do we transform the Security Council to be make it to make it much more effective and fit for purpose to this growing rea reality. You know, we are also standing at the cusp of change as the United Nations. We can either be dynamic or we become dinosaurs. And that choice is stark. And therefore, reforming of the Security Council is very much part of that overall change that the UN needs to make to become fit for purpose. Another question by Mike Gaines. What should the role of African regional economic blocks and security blocks have in positively taking advantage of the youth bulge? Absolutely, and very important question. You know, if we, are, if we are going to look at, we need to look at them as economic blocks. I mean, if I just were to look at the Horn of Africa, and if I were to look at Ethiopia, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Rwanda, Sudan, these countries together would be about nearly 700 million people by 2050. But these are countries that also have that a few macroeconomic adjustments can actually achieve double-digit economic growth. In fact, before uh, the COVID pandemic struck, these countries were doing pretty well on the, on the economic front with a, with a progressively upward domestic product. And just getting these as economic blocks, integrating them with infrastructure, with digitization, with, you know, um, with, with the Africa free trade area really working there, and working with these governments, they all, you know, they all governments with whom you know we could be engaging with, making sure that at the policy space and at the at the implementation phase, and this is where the value proposition of the UN is. For example, when I spoke about these six counties, the UN provided the boots on the ground. We provided the best public health experts, public finance management experts, you know, monitoring and evaluation experts, working with the county governments to make sure it happened. So you have to provide all the skill sets because there is a capacity gap in many of these counties. And therefore what happens is invariably, a lot of these programs that have a great amount of ambition fail simply because of a lack of the, of the, of the talent that is needed. And that is why I'm talking about North, South, North, and at the same time, private sector and the UN providing the connectivity to make all this happen. So it will be regional blocks, the SARC, SADA, EGAD, all of them coming together and working as large blocks because these are the blocks where you also have the markets and the wherewithal for connecting these countries to come together. So I feel that for large scale, voluminous, you know, where we are looking at trillions of dollars of investment with a clear mind towards a return of investment, that is the approach we will need to take. And I think all of them are seized with the matter. The African Union is trying very hard to put a special emphasis 
on the issue of youth. But as we all know that COVID, what it has done is also pushed nearly 150 million people back into poverty, which will happen by the end of this year. Most of them in sub-Saharan Africa and perhaps most of them in all of Africa. I think the point around COVID, it's, it's really interesting. Um, in, the, in the pandemic, we, we, at the beginning of the talk, you mentioned that the most conventional approach to addressing the youth bulge is to build the youth for the future. Something that's kind of become apparent in the pandemic is broadband access has kind of been an issue with students from home. The financial situation of some of the higher education institutions becoming a little more challenging. Do you have any thoughts on what kind of initiatives need to be prioritized to at least regain a footing? So, Karishma, we have to address the digital divide, and it is no more stark than it is in, in, in Africa. We've seen a digital divide. Even the pandemic has put a spotlight on the digital divide in most parts of the world, including the United States, where many children could not access school or they had to go to a, you know, to a, to a coffee shop nearby in order to kind of get to the, get to the Wi-Fi that they needed because they were unable to do, do their homework. And I think that the democracy of, of the digital divide has to be addressed. And we need a universal process of connecting people because that is where real power comes from, real information comes from. And I think this is, again, a convergence point for the US and China to come together. And that's why I'm talking about Shenzhen and Silicon Valley becoming the drivers of overcoming the digital divide and allowing you know, big data technology and innovation to really propel us in terms of the prosperity that we aspire for, the shared prosperity that we have aspired for for the world and the digital issue is key to that. I think Rafiq, you said you had a question that you wanted to ask. Yes, uh, Siddharth, I wanted to follow up on the earlier uh, question to, of mine to which you answered. And you talked about the BRI and the Blue Dot Network. Now the BRI is an investment infrastructure investment initiative. The Blue Dot Network is more a standards initiative. How will these come together? You know, I mean, why would why would American standards, I think China would welcome it actually, they've been talking about wanting higher standards and they've talked about enrolling the Americans in it, but there's not much percentage for the Americans to get involved in this. Um, and why would they legitimize Chinese investment in Africa? You know, I see there is a win-win proposition for both sides, because when you bring, now China is talking about a green BRI, when you bring the kind of, you know, America is a technological giant. You know, the disruption which is happening in the Silicon Valley. You know, I, I connected the, the Silicon Valley with the Silicon Savannah in Kenya, for example, in 2019 with Rockefeller Foundation, with UC Berkeley Center for Global Action, with the government of Kenya and the UN, we came together and created uh, an SDG accelerator lab. I see so many synergies here. I don't see a divergence here. I see economic opportunities here because had it not been for the exponential infrastructure growth that the United States saw in the early 19th century, America would not have seen this level of prosperity. Today, every part of America is connected. This is precisely what we need. As I talked about, Rafiq, the free movement of goods, services, and people, this is what I'm seeing every day in China into some of the remotest parts. You have railroads and, 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 and roadways which are heading in there, which is changing people's lives. It is about access. And access includes both the physical and the digital infrastructure. I don't see a contradiction here. Imagine that, like I said, if the, if the Bechtel and a road construction company, the road that I mentioned to you uh, from Kenya, uh, from Kenya's port of Lamu all the way to Addis, which was built by a Chinese company on time and on budget, financed by the European Union and the Africa Development Bank. But along that road, it left behind a wave of prosperous and happy people. In, in the bordering areas, which had seen internecine conflicts, those conflicts reduced. So the direct correlation of what the Secretary General ta talks about, the, the triple nexus of peace, security, and development, are, are, this is a prime example of how governments, the private sector, Chinese companies, European companies, financing, the UN, all coming together to see transformative change. And this is where I think, you know, our limitation is our imagination. If we can, this is unbridled opportunity and we just have to unlock it. And I think the UN can play a critical role here. 
RAND Corporation can play a critical role here. Many Chinese think tanks see exactly the same way. And this is also about the renewal of what I would term as, as the new wave of multilateralism, which we need to see happen. Over Reshma, to uh, is it okay if I ask a quick follow-up question? Of course. So Sid, uh, Siddharth, you know, the, the example of the standard gauge railway of Kenya comes to mind. Yeah. The Mombasa Kin to Nairobi yeah. link that um, someone who's on this call, one of my doctoral students, Karen Jew, is doing her dissertation on. Yeah. Now, you know, that's something where Kenya had nothing for a hundred years, you know. It replaced a rail line that had been built by the British in 1908, if I recall. So you had a hundred years when Western enterprise and the UN and so many organizations were free to do something about this great opportunity and did nothing. I just don't see why, what in the conditions of the, of the continent have changed that we might expect any difference. So Rafiq, let me be very blunt here. And I think we have to, first of all, start to you know, reorganize development models and to reorganize development models is we probably have to decolonize development too in Africa. What I've witnessed, I've seen the SGR in, in Kenya and it has changed people's lives. Absolutely changed people's lives. That journey from Nairobi to Mombasa, which could take anywhere from 12 to 14 hours has now shrunk to about four to five hours. I've been on that train. Yes. It's mild in all forms of controversy, but I can tell you one thing, that train system is changing the way goods, services, and people move. And I see enormous opportunities of similar networks getting connected, similar train systems getting connected, where again, I see an opportunity for the US and, and, and China to collaborate. Now, these things don't start to make money overnight. It takes time to make money. Are you aware that the New York subway is still in debt? But what it is doing, it is connecting people. It makes movement much easier and therefore businesses around what it is connected to thrive. And this is exactly what we need. So this rail line has been a game changer. I've been on that train. I've witnessed the change it has made. And yes, the UN too, we also got too stuck up in, in our project oriented work and you know, uh, depending on which donor wanted to finance what. And that is how we made our priorities. But this is what the ambition of the Secretary General is, to make the new UN fit for purpose, where we can invite the private sector, the public sector, be the convener, connector, and catalyzer of the exponential change, not about 10 villages or 20 villages, but about impacting millions of people. And that will not happen unless we start to think differently. We have to think with an ambition, as, as, as George Bernard Shaw said, you know, he said that, some men see things as they are and ask why, and some dream things that never was and ask why not. And frankly, Rafi, we are at that why not moment. It is a surge and an acceleration and leapfrogging that we need in order to achieve the 2030 agenda. Otherwise, through the conventional development model, we won't be able to do it. Over Thank you. Perhaps we need a few women now instead of a few men. Thanks, Rafi, and thanks, Mr. Chatterjee. I really appreciated that point at the end about um, things being a little different now. Um, I was wondering, do you have a couple of minutes that you could stay after six if we have a couple more questions? Oh. Okay, um, so we do have a couple more questions. I'm going to invite Joan to ask a question right now. First of all, thank you so much. Sid. Um, you're someone that saved my life, someone that saved the lives of many other people. You know better than most people the problems and the solutions, uh, how complex they are. And that kind of perspective that you have, the multilateralism, the need, um, it's a perspective that is somewhat lacking in more homogenous environments. And my question for you is, what kind of incentives, uh, what kind of recommendations do you have to better align um, you know, national interests, domestic interests, such as national security and the UN core mission of maintaining peace and security? Right now, they almost seem to be at odds in, in certain parts of the US, for example. How do we better align that? How do we, you know, what do we have to provide a cost to benefit approach? What do you recommend to, to bring people together to, you know, to fight for these causes and talk about? Well, you know, I think at every level, including, you know, major think tanks such as yours or schools, uh, universities, all have a role in the, kind of, in the kind of ideas that we need to generate. You know, recently, Joanne, I was invited by 
the Yale Center, which is here in, in, in Beijing, in, in China. And as you know, that China has a pretty vast network of Ivy League alums, you know, from, you know, from all the top Ivy League schools. And they all came together and, you know, uh, for a conversation, they wanted to hear from me. And we had a chat. You know, I realized that in that room, there are probably thousands and all of them have greatly benefited, like I have, from this opportunity that we had in the United States, which is transformational. Transformational. I mean, ever since I went to school at Princeton, I have to tell you, it changed my life in many ways, multiple ways. Everybody recognizes that. That soft power that the United States still brings to bear, where its schools are the most attractive place for people to go. Even till date, I have some interns in my office who are alums of Cornell and Columbia and all that. I mean, these kids are perhaps a little smarter than I am. But we need to kind of bring this new talent of young people from both sides to look at those points of convergence. Because, you know, if, if just left to, you know, the political elite, we will constantly see challenges. But we need other voices to come in. And that is why the academic infrastructure, the technological infrastructure, the private sector can actually help to, you know, minimize all that. And this is where I see a central role of the UN. As I said, the aspiration of, of, of uh, Harry Truman was to see a UN when it was created in 1945, was one that would actually be a bridge. And perhaps that moment is now even more necessary. And, I'm, and, and I want to say this with every emphasis at my disposal, because what we are seeing, and the Secretary General has oft, often reminded us, he says, the world is in pieces and we need world peace. We have over 75 million people displaced currently, either as refugees or as inter, uh, internally displaced or fleeing as migrants. The largest displacement post the Second World War, and this has just happened in the last 10 years. Imagine what the fallout of COVID could be. I imagine what I talked about in terms of the migrants that would now leave Africa simply because of sheer despondency and hopelessness. So, you know, the nexus of peace and security are closely interlinked. We did a report on the journey to violent extremism in Africa by, by, by the UN in, in, in 2017. And what we found was there were key drivers that pushed young people into the arms of extremist groups. It started with unemployment a sense of despondency, a sense of hopelessness, a sense of marginalization. And there was a, another very important element there is the heavy handedness of the states, gross violation of, of, of rights. And as a result, what happened was you ended up having a lot of these young people joining the Al-Shabaab or the Boko Haram and, and all that. This is where, again, I see as member states, as the US, as China, as the UN, we could actually be working with African governments working to make sure that from a governance perspective, from an economics policy perspective, from a national policy perspective, we are able to give them the best possible support. And yet at the implementation, we are there with them because we finally have to have those capacities. And those capacities will come when you have online and real mentoring. If you look at the change, uh, let's take Africa and South Korea. South Korea saw a meteoric rise. Let's be reminded that between 1950 to 1980, the United States invested $60 billion in South Korea. Between 1950 and 1980, the United States invested $60 billion in Africa. But I think that moment has come now with, or as I said, there is an aging, there's what we call a demographic echo. Most of the world's population is aging. New markets are emerging then. And that is how we need to address it. So I think self-interest with, with a shared purpose is where we need to go. We are not talking about being charitable. No, we are not. And, and that is precisely what has actually held Africa back is over, over, over emphasis on charity and corporate social responsibility and providing stuff for free. You know, the whole concept of teaching them how to fish rather than constantly giving them the fish. I mean, till date, it's sad to see that in South Sudan. You know, what I saw in 2000, the year 2000, when I started the first office during the war in South Sudan and the way food was distributed, Nothing has changed 21 years later. It's exactly the same way. People entirely dependent on a WFP plane that comes and throws food down. Have we as the UN perhaps failed? I think so. So there's much more that needs to be done in rearranging that landscape. And this is precisely what the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres is trying to do.
So I'm very grateful for you to add some time. So I'm just gonna, um, on behalf of Eddie Rand Graduate School, um, IDSS and Rand CAP, I'm gonna thank you and then um, hand it off to Krishna to ask one final question. Thank you, Karishma. And it gives me a chance again to say thank you, Sid, for this really uh, inspiring talk and the discussion. I just had a comment uh, to, to, um, to make. Um, you know, and this tries to bring together this population youth issue with digital jobs, digital infrastructure, which we have talked about quite a bit. People say that the world has a problem with aging, but not all countries are aging, as you've repeatedly pointed out, how youthful Africa is. So in some ways, the world together has the right population pyramid, if you will. It's a question of how do we make it work across national boundaries? And you know, I can see capital or foreign investment flowing into Africa, working with the labor to produce goods and services, which can be used within Africa, which can be exported. But the movement of people, as you might uh, imagine, is going to be politically a problem. Uh, and therefore, what digital infrastructure, digital jobs allows the Africans to do is to participate in the global market virtually. I mean, and of course, the pandemic has increased that, but you know, world over the, the, you know, we keep talking about the gig economy in the US, but it was the developing world that first gave the, the concept of gig economy to the world. And so therefore that can be catalyzed by some of the things uh, that you're saying. And, and thank you again. Krishna, I would just conclude by one part and uh, why I'm talking about the free movement of goods, services, and people, which is much more necessary in Africa today, you know, from east to west and north to south. If you look at the Silicon Valley ecosystem, all the top tech companies are people who came from particular parts of South Asia. You know, so we are talking about that cross-pollination that we also need to see happen. Today, you know, the Manhattan Project, it was a Chinese physicist who actually taught at Princeton for close to six years who supported the Manhattan Project, the intellectual capital that she brought to the Manhattan Project. So I, I really believe that that process, maybe, yeah, maybe there'll be no more physical movement because of the advent of digital spaces. And the fact that, you know, from here, I'll actually be now speaking to Bangkok and moving to a different time zone is interesting that we could actually have these exchanges. But ultimately, Krishna, a shared future of humanity is when humans interact with each other physically a shared perception, our cultures, our nuances, our races, our religions. These may divide us, but they also unite us. We have the same DNAs, those have not changed. We are, we are all the same in flesh and blood. The issue is in the last few years, we've also seen an element of, an egregious element of hate coming up. And that hate has become, you know, it's, it's become much more visible. The hate in the social media space, the hate and violence that we've seen across the world, what we now need to do is bring once again back that message of compassion. And I think, you know, when I, well, I went to a, an American missionary school in India, and I recall the first words of compassion, the caring, you know, the, 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 the sense of brotherhood and sisterhood, and that made you feel that you were part of a bigger family. I really believe we have to resurrect that spirit of compassion and bring it back into the discourse. It should not be a word that should be left to the dustbin of history. That is a wonderful note on which to end. So thanks to you. Thanks to everybody who participated. Have a good day and a good evening.